when all this started of, I guess it was about two weeks ago now. And, and, and obviously I know that it goes back, you know, yeah. many, many more years, but I mean, in the most recent iteration uh, right. since George Floyd's death and, and we really started to see uh, something take a hold in cities across the country. What was, as a, someone that talks to, to families, um, you know, on a daily basis, what was going through your mind? I would have to say fear, horror, um, a plethora of emotions, anger, um, because, you know, I am also a mother of uh, two boys, adult sons. So to see this man's uh, life, these men's, men's life taken publicly and uh, was, it was just a horrific feeling at the time. Was it a sense of, here we go again, like not again, like we're going through this again. Is that kind of what, what the, the, the feeling is like? Definitely, definitely. You know, you think about the historical context of racial inequality and privilege in America. It was just like, yet again, another incidence where we are uh, being publicly mistreated. Um, our lives are not valued. Um, and yet this is by a group of people that are supposed to protect us, you know, and especially specifically in the last incident with uh, George Floyd. Um, but like you said, it, there's so many incidences such as Breonna Taylor, where, you know, this group of people, law enforcement are supposed to protect us and to see um, this group um, on more than one occasion, not protect us again. And it was that feeling of, wow, this is just, is, will this ever end? And, and this just keeps happening. Yes, I agree. There's, I guess there's two ways of, of looking at this when it comes to parents talking to their kids. Mm -hmm. And there's two different conversations. There's the, the conversation that, that, a, uh, that, that a black family has with their children is entirely different than the conversation that a white family has. Definitely. With their children. Uh, what are the biggest differences that, that you, you see in, in those uh, conversations? Well, you know, it's funny that you brought that up because somewhere, you know, one of the things parents have to keep in mind when we're all having those conversations is that we have to first be aware of our own emotions. You know, like where are we at the proper frame mind when we're having those talks because it could go bad really quickly if we're not aware of how we're feeling, right? Um, I see you laughing, so you probably understand that piece as a parent, right? <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. And, and I'll say this, there's, you know, I'm not going to be able to say that often in this conver in this conversation that we're having the the words i understand is not going to come out of my mouth a lot because i can't understand uh mm -hmm. and i want to learn mm -hmm. and i want to listen and um but but in that context of of you know me having uh a, a, a two children um you know one who's a toddler who's really just starting to to figure things out just a little bit mm -hmm. i understand so i apologize uh and and please continue I don't know. No, that's fine. And I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate the fact that you are willing as a white male to say, I, I don't understand, but I want to learn. I, I think those those types of conversations are beneficial for us uh, women and African-American men. Uh, I think that we need more of that. Um, however, you know, again, be mindful of how we're feeling because, again, we want to make sure we're in a right state of mind. But also age is going to kind of guide the conversation because we don't want to have the conversation with our teenager that we would have with our uh, elementary school student correct you know so I think that plays a big part but when you talk about the talk you know somewhere around the age 12 I would say if not sooner many African-American families engage in what we call or we reference sometimes as the talk and that's kind of like the do's and the don'ts um, the checklist or the steps that needs to be taken in order to remain safe and to survive in this country. And so, yes, I was, and, and I don't think that that's just one conversation. It's a succession of conversations that you continue to have um, in lieu of some of the events in the news and the media. And just in general, some of the interactions that may occur um, is one of those things that you kind of keep having ongoing, even until adulthood. So I, I, I want to get this straight and, and I, I apologize. I, I don't want to while I, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm so naive that I come off as uh, insensitive or insincere. So right. but I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly. While, say, white parents are talking to their kids around that age about 
you know, hey, make sure you look both ways when you cross the street. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, black families are telling their kids, listen, this is what you need to do so that you don't die in yes. the street. Yes, I definitely would agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that sounds naive. I think that's a um, valid question. I would agree. And I can't speak for every black home, you know, but I definitely know that from uh, my counseling sessions, from being a, a raised in an African-American home with black brothers and, and, um, and, and, you know, with black people general in general, um, that is a conversation that most families have. You know, and even if it's not like a sit down specific formal conversation, again, it's, a on, it's an ongoing dialogue pointing out the differences between race and inequality, racial inequality and privilege. And that there are some things that we just cannot do, you know, versus what another group of people may be able to do. And that's something that, I mean, I, I would imagine uh, that most white families don't realize. That, about the talk? About the talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm. I would say that that may be so. I, I do come across a population similar to you that want to know more um, and learn more. And I generally see those populations within my office, um, precisely why they may have come to an Af African American psychologist. Um. So when it comes to what would you suggest to a, um to a, a white mother or a white father talking to their kids, they see what's on TV right now, they see the protests, they see, um, they see police brutality for the first times, and they're, they're wondering, why, why are people getting hurt? Why are people yelling? What, what is going on? Uh, the what is going on is such a loaded question, but how do you, in, how do you start that conversation with, with a young child that is naive to what is actually happening in the outside world? Well, I think, you know, like we talked about, age is going to guide that conversation because, again, you don't want to have the conversation with the elementary school student that you have with your tweener or your teenager. But honesty is very important. We need to be honest about it. And if the child is in elementary school, I would elicit conversations about how do they feel about what they're seeing? What if they already heard maybe from friends or, or at school? And why do they think it's happening? And at that point, you know, we need to validate how they're feeling, but also make sure we, we correct any maladaptive thinking that all one group is bad based upon their race or all one group is better or good or superior based upon their race. You know, at that time, depending on how, you know, the parent feels having these types of conversations with the elementary child, we may want to also relate it to the broader historical context of, again, racial inequality and privilege, letting, helping them to understand some of the emotions that fuel the protest. You know, we, you know, we gotta step outside of just what has happened recently and again, connect it for them to the bigger historical context and, and events. Um, I would say for the older children, you do some, something similar like teenagers, tweeners, you know, but with them, when you're eliciting the conversation, it might be a little bit more difficult because you tend to hear, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> but it's not impossible. But have those discussions solely kind of, not solely, but you want to kind of frame those conversations about around social media because that group tends to get a lot of their information and a lot of their news from social media. And maybe asking some questions about, hey, what, what are they saying on social media? What are you watching? You know, being able to hear what they're listening to or, or talk to them about what's going on and the online presence and how sometimes the online presence can be very racially biased, mm -hmm. you know? I, I, was, I was just going to say, can't so, you know, involving social media in this, there'll be a double-edged sword considering how vile uh, social media can, can be, especially mm -hmm. nowadays? Well, the reason why I brought the social media piece up is because most of that age group is connected to social media. And so you're, you're kind of asking them, what are you looking at? You know, what are you, what do you think about what you're seeing? You know, what are you, what are some of the views that you're getting or some of the views that you're taking away from social media so that you can have that conversation and be able to A, find out where they're at and B, be able to let them know that, you know, uh, social media can be very racially biased and it can present a story that's not necessarily true. We want to try to stay away from preaching to them, though, like that's right or that's wrong, but I'd rather help them or guide them to kind of come to their own conclusions. But again, challenging those conclusions that, again, are racially unfair um, or that are biased or, in, or unequal in thought processes. Does that make how, sense? It does. It does. I, I was wondering how difficult must it be? And, and, and I mean, I'm not at that age yet with my, uh, with, with my children, obviously. My children aren't at that age. Um, and I don't necessarily remember 
having, you know, racial equality conversation with, with my parents. I, I just, it always just came natural to my family and, and I was fortunate enough where I was raised the right way. Um, I think I mentioned that to you last night, but with that in mind, um, how difficult can it be for, you know, a parent to, to have that conversation and, and make sure their, their, their child is, uh, you know, put on the right path early on so that, uh, they, they do go into life with an open mind, knowing that, you know, every, you know, we all deserve to be treated equally. I, I think that it can be really difficult um, when we're not self-aware, you know, when, we, when we're not aware of our own racial biases, our own um, tendencies towards uh, people that look more like us or even our privilege. So it can be a very difficult thing. I think that's why it's important when I talked about honesty to first be honest with yourself to make sure that you are in the right frame of mind because when we're not, we can really um, portray a group of people or incidences or situations in, in a very unfair light. You know, the research shows that children as young as six months can begin to tell the difference between uh, people of different racial backgrounds. You know, and somewhere between two to four, they start to formulate how um, to think about a group based upon what we give them and how we present and how we um, talk about that group or even behave in terms of that group or, or even the exposure, you know, even the exposure. Um, and so that's why it's important with the elementary age group to kind of keep limit the exposure to some of the news events. Yes, they should know and yes, there should be a, 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 a honest conversation. But I tell my families all the time that I treat, there's a difference between being informed and being inundated. And so limiting yourself to some of the exposure, and even the younger people, some of the exposure is really a, a good option so that you can have healthy conversation, but it not be overload. What do you tell a, a, a child that, that asks, you know, wh why are people yelling in the street right now? What, what, why are people, you know, running into stores? And, and, and I'm not gonna make this, Listen, I, I think you and I both know there, there, there's a, a certain group of people that are doing this, and then there are people that are actually truly protesting. Um, but to a young mind, they don't see, they don't know that difference. They, they don't see that difference. Uh, they're not well versed enough to uh, being able to differentiate between the two. So, how do you, what do you tell a, a, a child that is wondering why are people so angry right now? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a teachable moment and it's important for them in that, in that context, we, again, we want to relate it back to them understanding the larger social context, but at the age uh, appropriate level. And so that conversation can look a little bit like there are some people in this world that mistreat others based upon the color of their skin. And unfortunately, some of those people that mistreat people are in power and are supposed to protect them. And this has happened over and over again where that protection was not happening. So as a result, these group of people are fueled with emotions because they feel that they have been mistreated. And it has been demonstrated and proven that this group has been repeatedly mistreated for decades, for centuries. You know, we can go back, we can relate this back to slavery, right? And so having them understand that in the context that this is just not a couple of incidents, this is an ongoing pattern. And then unfortunately, this group of people has been mistreated by people that are supposed to protect them. And I think simplifying it like that and having those discussions, like they're just not mad about one or two things, honey, but this is an ongoing thing where they've been violated and mistreated just because of the color of their skin. There's so, plenty of resources too out there, Matt. Um, Sesame Street uh, has an awesome resource that talks uh, about color and diversity. It's called Town Hall Racism. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, uh, you know, good resources out there for that younger age group where you don't want to get too deep, but you want them to, to, to understand that this is not just happening just now. I, I can't tell you the amount of, I mean, we talk about social media and, and there are, there are, there are sprinkles of, of good in social media. And I can't tell you how much I saw uh, people share the, the clip from the, the Sesame Street town hall uh, from this past weekend where why can't we all be like Louie's dad? Uh, or, or Elmo's dad, Louie. Um, but, but, but I mean, I, so, so I'm, I'm, you mentioned that and, and I'm, I'm going to piggyback a kind you know, a question that Elmo had, which I'm going to ask you, which mm -hmm. is what is, what is racism? 
again, it's when someone mistreats someone based upon the color of their skin. And that mistreatment goes beyond just a nasty word, but it's also a systematic structure. Now that's a big word for the elementary uh, student, but you know, it's the truth, it's systematic structure. So maybe explaining in terms that they can understand, like when, a, when something's put in place to purposely make someone that looks different feel worse, have lesser goods, have lesser resources, and be treated in a poor manner simply because they're different and they look different. 